Hello, I'm Lev Weitzman, and uh, this is the second Kirtaman history video aid, or study guide video aid, um, for my students, and it is out of chronological order. I do not have the willpower to make a second video about the kings, um, and I feel like this is useful for my personal students. So this, um, this lesson will be on the First and Second Macedonian Wars and the uh, um, Seleucid or Roman Syrian War. Uh, which happens, all this happens in the time frame of 214 BC to 189 BC, or 188 BC, really. Um, and it's the story of how Rome gets involved in the Hellenistic world, which is all well and good. It starts around 200 BC. Okay, that's where we'll start the story, right? Not really, though, because Rome was involved in the um, Hellenistic world for upwards of 100 years prior to their actual military involvement in Greece and Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. Um, what, about, what I mean by that is in the year 323 BCE, when Alexander the Great died at Babylon, according to legend, there was a Roman envoy present at his court that heard his last will and testament, which, according to legends, was the quote, to the strongest, which led to the Hellenistic um, Didochic Wars. But that's a separate thing. That's... That was the beginning of the Hellenistic period, though, Alexander the Great's death. After his death, the um, Alexander the Great's empire, the Macedonian Empire, broke up into many uh, different groups, three of which survived into the year 200 BC, or more technically, but three big ones. Uh, and that would be the Antigonid Macedonians, who controlled this region of the world, mostly Thrace, Macedonia, and northern Greece. Uh, and they were the least territorially expansive of the three major Hellenistic world powers, but they're important. And then, of course, the Ptolemies, who controlled this area of the world, mostly just Egypt, but also Syria and the Levant. And then there were the Seleucids, who were the, the big the big ones. They controlled all of what was the former academic Persian Empire. So Syria, Asia Minor, Mesopotamia, and Iran, Bactria, and all that. And how Rome gets involved militarily is, you know, 323 BC, uh, Alexander the Great dies. The Ro Rome is involved in the Samnite Wars and expanding in Italy. And then in um, 264 BC, the First Punic War occurs. Uh, and over the course of 20 years, Rome wins that war. Um, and there's a, a brief interbellum uh, period. Uh, but then in 218 BC, the Carthaginians again are angered by the Romans and destroy Roman allies, Saguntum, which launches, of course, the Second Punic War, which lasts until 201 BC. But in the Second Punic War, this is where our, start, our story will begin. Um, Hannibal, who was the Carthaginian general who destroyed a Roman ally in Spain and thus started the Second Punic War, um, he was probably the greatest military mind of his generation, even probably greater than Scipio Africanus, who would eventually defeat him. And so he managed to destroy a full Roman army at the Battle of Cannae. I'm sure this sounds familiar. And after which... Um, Many world leaders from across the ancient world approached him about allying themselves to Carthage, and this included uh, Italian leaders, um, but also foreign Hellenistic leaders, one of whom was Philip V, who was the leader of Antigone Macedonia at this time. Um, and so, according to Livy, Philip V sent three ships across the Adriatic Sea, across the Mare Hadriaticum, as, Latin, as the Romans called it, um, with envoys and letters to Hannibal requesting an alliance. And um, these were intercepted. Hannibal knew about, uh, you know, Philip V's desire to be in alliance, and they were in cahoots for a long time. But these letters were intercepted, and so the Romans knew what was going on. So they prepared their uh, their fleet for what would what they assumed would be a mainland invasion of Italy that would start at Brindisium, uh, which is right over here. Um, and come from, of course, Illyricum and Epirus and mainland Greece by Philip V. And uh, so they readied their fleet, and in 214 BC they um, declared like an anti-piracy policy, and uh, as a part of this they destroyed many Macedonian ships. They raided the um, towns in mainland Greece and Epirus, uh, Apollonia and Phoenice, or Phoenis. Um, and this uh, type of sort of guerrilla sea warfare would last for some time. The Romans assigned the proconsul Marcus 
Olerius Lywinus to sort of prosecute this war, and he did it quite successfully. And although there was no decisive major battle uh, in, the fir in the first Macedonian War, which is what this is, which lasted from 214 BC to 205 BC, um, Macedonia never really came out on top. And so modern historians sort of interpret it as a Roman victory, although it's kind of unclear what it was, since there was no real um, major changing of territory. But it did result in the um, signing of the Treaty, uh, Treaty of Foiniki, which uh, had Philip V pay an indemnity and promised not to lie with Hannibal and all that. By this point, Hannibal was not really a threat, 205 BC. Um, that's around the time the Romans started considering invading mainland Africa. Um, but it was good to have that Hellenistic threat out of view for a little bit. But then, after um, some years of uh, sort of relative peace, the Philip V was still in power in Antigone Macedonia in 201 BC, and uh, this is when he sort of started becoming a little bit oppressive towards some of the Greek city-states that he had under his control, including Athens, the Achaean League, which uh, would be centered in the Peloponnese, and the Aetolians, which would be in, like, northwestern Greece, near Epirus, almost, and uh, also northeastern Greece. Like, this is the Aetolian region, kind of right, like, south of Macedonia. Um, and all of these places would sort of launch an embassy to Rome and say, hey, we don't like how Philip V is treating us, can you help us out? And the Romans agree. Um, and also, Rhodes approaches um, Rome about this as well, about a different threat. At the same time, though, about the, the Seleucid Empire. So Rome is sort of aware that there are some Hellenistic threats. And so 201 BC is when the Second Macedonian War starts. The Romans send a, an, a huge army of around 25,000 soldiers under the command of Titus Quinctius Flamininus, uh, to defeat Philip V. And um, Titus Quinctius Flamininus basically just chase, chases Philip V around the Macedonian hinterland, and he has a lot of allies in Greece, so he, most of the soldiers he has under his command aren't necessarily Roman, but they're like Greek, Aetolian, Achaean. Um, and so in 197 BC, uh, Quinctius Flamininus finally believes that he's caught Philip V because Philip V is at this major Macedonian city, Larissa, and uh, Flamininus is approaching. And so the, the Philip takes his Macedonian soldiers, who also number about 25,000. Flamininus takes his 25,000, and they uh, march towards each other during a rainstorm. And uh, they approach these hills called the uh, Sinocephali Hills, which means Dog's Head Hills. And it's so rainy and foggy that they're only like one or two miles from each other, huge armies, um, and they don't see each other. Right, so Philip V sends his um, his uh, soldiers up the hill, and um, the Sinocephali Hills, and Flamininus tries to dissuade him from doing so. Flamininus, under his command, has around twenty five thousand soldiers, uh, including a some number of war elephants, and uh, Philip V has around twenty six thousand soldiers on, under his command. Probably not including war elephants, although he might have had some, but, like, mainly Macedonian flanksmen and, like, some mercenaries from Thrace and Illyria. Uh, and so these, uh, what's notable about this encounter is Sinocephali, it's two different types of military formations matching up. The Macedonians have the flanks, which is, like, a big square uh, of soldiers with massive pikes called sarissae that were apparently 12 feet long, so they could keep uh, stabbing at enemies from a distance. And um, the Romans, on the other hand, had the manipular system, the legionary system, where the main weapon of the legionnaire was a sword. So they sort of would charge at people. And uh, they would keep in very packed ranks and stab, stab, stab. You know, stab, stab, stab. Although they probably didn't have the bodies at this point in time. They had a different type of short sword. Um, through their... Scudum, scudum, which are Roman shields that are huge. And uh, the maniple system fought in like individual units, sentries or cohorts usually, which allowed for greater flexibility, where the flank sort of was just one big square. Um, so Philip V at Sinocephali originally had the high ground on the hill. Just um, imagine this is the top of the hill, this is the bottom. Philip V will be in orange. He has one big flanks with around 16,000 soldiers and some cavalry, whatever, cavalry, which aren't going to be used to great effect. Um, actually, I don't think he had cal I don't think he deployed cavalry at this battle. He probably used um, light skirmishers. That's a mistake on my part. Um, light skirmishers. 
which I'm using the same symbol, so it doesn't matter. Instead of cavalry, because he couldn't really deploy cavalry on a hill. These would be slingers, archers, whatever. He's at the top of the hill. Meanwhile, the Romans are at the bottom. And uh, they have a number of maniples, which could be made up of 100 men, 500 men, whatever. Mostly infantry, although they do also have light skirmishers. And uh, they have deep ranks, which allows for coordination and maneuverability. And so Philip V, utilizing his high ground, orders his, like, like javelin men, light skirmishers, slingers. He orders them to just hurl missiles onto the Romans and eventually uh, launches a, a full-on rush down the hill with their cigarette you know, fixed. Um, and this is this was basically an attempt to intimidate the Romans into just breaking, breaking ranks and fleeing. Because if someone's running down a hill at you with a huge spear and there are 25,000 of them, you're going to want to get out of the way. But what the Romans did it actually is they held their ground um, and uh, they basically broke it to a stalemate. But since some of these slingers were matching up against full, fully armed heavy infantry Roman legionnaires, uh, the uh, infantry couldn't hold their ground. And so part of the Roman right wing actually broke off. Um, which was against Flaminimus, who was the leading com the Roman commander of this battle's wishes, but a tribune ordered some of his troops to break off on the right side, and uh, who were facing light skirmishers, and face off against the Macedonian flanks. And since the Macedonians had their hands full already, when this new number of heavy infantrymen sh showed up, they just immediately broke, and they ran. They ran back up the hill. And it was, it was a rout. So the Romans killed thousands of Macedonians. They lost a lot of soldiers as well. Um, it was, like, generally it was showing, like, how maneuverable the uh, manipulator system was. And it was a total defeat for Philip V, which led him to sue for peace and uh, give more freedom to the, uh, the Greek city-states. Right? So that was in 197 BC. Officially, this might come back out later with the white door. Officially, the war ended in 196 BC when Flamininus went to the Isthmian Games, which were one of the Panhellenic Games along with the um, Olympic Games, and he declared freedom for all the Greeks. And Flamininus loved Greeks, so like, and they loved him too now. So that was all well and dandy. And uh, so Philip V would no longer be a threat to the Romans. As a part of the treaty which ended the Second Macedonian War, he is actually um, forced to be a Roman ally. And uh, at this time, before his defeat in the Second Macedonian War, he was talking with the Seleucids, who were again, who were again in Persia, um, about attacking the Egyptians, the Ptolemies, who had control of Syria and Egypt, and taking their territory for themselves. Um, but, obviously, Philip V could no longer support the Seleucid king, whose name was Antiochus III, uh, which upset Antiochus III, but Antiochus III was a great general. And after the Second Punic War, uh, around the year like 195, 196 BCE, Antiochus III heard about Hannibal's, you know, ill fortune. Again, he was defeated at the Battle of Zama in, you know, 200s BC. Uh, and uh, so Antiochus III took Hannibal into his court and started forming this massive army with all these great generals and all that. And uh, he had, he hired... A, a mercenary from Rhodes to lead his navy, and Hannibal was also in charge of the navy, so he, two of the best naval commanders of all time, under, you know, his retinue, and he himself led a lot of military excursions. Antiochus III basically wanted to be another Alexander the Great. He campaigned in Bactria, which is in modern-day Afghanistan, like, all the way over there, in, like, the Indus River Valley, all the way over there. In Syria, he conquered Syria from the Ptolemies, uh, and then one time he tried to invade Egypt, but the Romans, uh, especially a man named Nias, Popilius Linus, uh, told him to back off. And so he did because he didn't want a full-blown war with the Romans at that time. Uh, and he also had um, ambitions to conquer mainland Greece uh, after he realized that the Macedonians would no longer be a suitable ally. So around um, 192 BC, Rhodes approaches Rhodes and Pergamum, 
Pergamon was a kingdom that inhabited the northwestern corner of Turkey, and Rhodes uh, controlled the southwestern corner of Turkey, what is now known as Caria, and also major Aegean islands, including Rhodes itself. They sent an embassy to Rome and said, Antiochus III is like really messing with us, and he's trying to lie with the Achaean and Aetolian League, which again were Roman allies in the Macedonian War, and uh, to aid his mainland, like his invasion of mainland Greece, and he's really like upset at us. Uh, and so the commander of Pergamon, Eumenes the second, and the Rhodes and the Rhodians were like, "We will help you out if you attack um, Antiochus the third for us." And so the Romans were like, "You know what? You got it." So they sent this guy named Lucius Regillus, also the famous general Scipio Africanus, uh, another guy named Menias Achilles Glabrio, and Scipio Africanus's brother, Scipio or Lucius. Um, Cornelius Scipio, who would later be known as Lucius Cornelius Scipio Asiaticus. Um, so this was like a crack team of the best generals Rome could get together. And uh, what they did was they went to Greece, established like garrisons in mainland Greece, and when in 192-191, when Antiochus III actually crossed the Hellespont and invaded Macedonia in the area around Larissa and the Aetolians, they just went straight at him. And, um, this resulted in the Battle of Thermopylae in 191 BC. And the Battle of Thermopylae, Thermopylae might sound similar. Yes, it was a battle in the Persian Wars where 300 Spartans and 6,000 other Greeks faced off against the massive, supposedly massive, Achaemenid army. This is a separate thing. 191 BC is when it happened. The general commanding the Roman forces at this uh, battle were called um, was called Menias Achilles Glabrio. Um... And I think the whiteboard will come up for this again. He had a subordinate officer with him named uh, Marcus Portius Cato. Not Cato the Younger, but actually his ancestor, who would later be known as Cato the Elder. He was a military tribune in this battle. He's actually an important figure, right? So, the Battle of Thermopylae. The... Thermopylae is a mountain. Thermopylae is actually the name of a mountain pass, which is uh, where the initial fighting happened with Manias Achilles Glabrio, who will be blue, with his major manipular infantry force facing off against Antiochus III and his major um, infantry force. And they both had around 16,000 soldiers or so. Um, and so Thermopylae was obviously very hilly, again, it was on a mountain, and all that. So with, uh, which was, you know, not ideal for cavalry fighting, which is why the fact that uh, Manias Achilles Glabrio had some uh, mounted soldiers under the command of Marcus Portius, C Mar Marcus Portius Cato was a little odd to the Seleucids. But, you know... The infantry were really going at it at this very narrow pass, so only a couple hundred men were dying at a time. Uh, and since it was such treacherous terrain all around the area, um, the Seleucids never guessed that Marcus Portius Cato would go around on the hills, on the mountains, with his mounted soldiers, and uh, hit the side and rear of the um, Seleucid force, which threw the entire Seleucid army into disarray because they'd never expect the Roman army to show up from the hillside. Um, and Marcus Portius Cato's actions here led to the destruction of the Seleucid army at uh, Thermopylae. According to ancient sources, of the 16,500 16, soldiers under the Seleucid command, and by the way, the Romans had around 16,500 as well, only 500 survived, including Antiochus III, uh, and he escaped to Asia. So after um, this battle, which was a major boon for the Romans, and basically ended... Uh, Antiochus's invasion of uh, mainland Greece and its tracks, um, the war sort of took a, a naval turn, with Hannibal and Polyxenides, or Polyxenidas from Rhodes commanding the uh, Seleucid navy. It was about to be, you know, a great, great uh, uh, contest. So Eumenes II of Pergamon, might be from Rhodes, I'm not sure, well, took up the main naval command for the Romans. I think he was, I think he was from Pergamon. Um, yeah, I think he was from Pergamon. But also Lu Lucius Aemilius Regulus, I think that was his name. It was Lucius Regulus, for sure. 
um, was also a naval commander. And so there were two battles. One, the major one that decided the fate of the Seleucid Navy was the Battle of Myonesis. And the Rhodian naval commander, uh, who is fighting for Antiochus, Polysanidas, faced off against Eumenes II, and his uh, forces were completely destroyed. Right, so the naval campaign was a failure. The mainland invasion of Greece was a failure, which, uh, and Antiochus III was a fairly proud man, so at this point he was still not suing for peace. But now is the Romans' time to go on the offensives. So they sent Scipio Africanus' brother, Lucius Cornelius Scipio, um, to cross the Hellespont and go to Magnesia, which is around this area, Magnesia ad Silipum, um, or Sipilum, uh, and, uh, which was like sort of a deserty, like sandy sort of plain, and face off against Antiochus III and his massive cavalry force, and also infantry force. And this was the um, sort of coup de grace of the Roman campaign. Antiochus III was fighting to keep all of his possessions he had spent his entire career gaining. So, Antiochus III will be orange. He had his main flanks, but also tons and tons of heavy cavalry, which are known as uh, cataphracti, and would sometimes be mounted on camels. Probably in this battle they would be. And archers and whatnot. And, um... The Romans had this, uh, pretty substantial infantry force. Not as many, um, cavalry, but basically Antiochus III overextended his cavalry, um, by charging and just hitting the Roman wings, which were, like, heavy infantry. Um, and so that left his center very exposed, and so the Romans used the advance of the Seleucid cavalry to attack the center of the Seleucid army, which was weaker than the cataphracti, where they were less heavily armored, and the center collapsed. And after that, um, the Seleucid cataphracti realized they could never win the battle, and they retreated. This is uh, huge armies, thousands and ten tens and thousands of soldiers on each side. And it was an entire route, like, every Seleucid soldier ran and fled, and... Um, they they basically abandoned their entire camp. They marched all the way to Sardis without even returning to their camp. And uh, Sardis is, by the way, um, I'm going to move this back over here. Sardis is a city, like, right around here, and Magnesia happened right around here, so it's a long march. And they had a head start on the Romans because the Romans would spend some time celebrating their victory, all that, and uh, raiding the enemy camp. But after this, Antiochus III realized his reign of terror, as the Romans would call it, really his ambitious career, was over. He sued for peace, and uh, thus the Treaty of Apamea was formed, which was signed in 188 BCE, and basically had Antiochus III pay a massive, massive war indem indemnity to the, um, the Romans. Like, this would probably be the equivalent of almost a billion dollars, probably a hundred millions in terms of buying power. Uh, and another um, condition of the Treaty of Apamea was that uh, all of Asia Minor would go to the hands of Pergamon and Rhodes. So the Seleucids would have to abandon what was really the heart of their empire. And their new borders would be the Taurus Mountains, which were right here. So imagine sharing a land border with Mastan and now sharing a land border with Turkey. Like, that's hundreds of miles, right? Um, and also they had to back off Egypt. They basically had to disband most of their army, and uh, they could never launch another military campaign without notifying Rome and getting their permission first. And so Rome, after this point, kept a somewhat permanent, but what they called temporary garrison in mainland Greece, which would lead to further conflicts, the Third and Fourth Macedonian Wars, down the line. But this video is getting really long, and we covered a lot, and it's very complicated topics, uh, so I will end it there.